Uh, we'll start over here with Reuters, please. Thank you, Secretary General Robin Emmett, Reuters. Uh, NATO has been watching the Russian battle groups move through the English Channel over the last few days. Can you give us any update on what you've learned, um, how many uh, fighter bombers on board, or, or any idea of um, whether your initial I idea of the, um, the uh, battle group's trajectory is correct? Thank you. <coughs> So Russia has the right to operate uh, battle groups, uh, naval ships like this, in international uh, waters. And we have seen this battle group uh, being deployed before, uh, also to the Mediterranean. Uh, so that is something which has happened before, and we are monitoring uh, the uh, deployment and the movement of this uh, battle group in uh, a normal way, uh, in a measured and responsible way, as we always uh, do. What is different this time uh, is that uh, uh, the uh, battle group uh, may be used uh, to uh, increase uh, Russia's ability to take part in combat operations over Syria and to conduct even more airstrikes against Aleppo. And uh, this raises serious uh, questions and concerns over Russia's commitment to working to a political solution to the conflict in Syria. And uh, more airstrikes by Russian planes uh, will exacerbate uh, the humanitarian uh, suffering in Aleppo. And therefore, we call on Russia to uh, contribute uh, to a political solution uh, to implement the ceasefire and to stop the bombing of Aleppo. So uh, the concern is that uh, the Kuznetsov uh, carrier group can be used as a platform uh, for increased uh, airstrikes uh, against uh, civilians in uh, Aleppo. We'll go to the second row here, please. Um, so <coughs> in the light of what you just said, how would you comment uh, on the fact NATO allies supplying the Russian ships? Well, it is for uh, each uh, uh, nation uh, to decide whether uh, uh, these ships can uh, get uh, supplies and uh, fu fueling and be fueled uh, in different uh, uh, harbors uh, along the route towards uh, the eastern uh, Mediterranean. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we are concerned, and I have expressed that very clearly, uh, about the uh, uh, potential use of this battle group uh, to uh, increase Russia's ability and to be a platform for uh, uh, airstrikes against uh, uh, Syria. And this is something I have conveyed uh, uh, very clearly before, and I repeat those concerns uh, today. Uh, and uh, I, I, I believe that all NATO allies are aware of that this uh, battle group can be used uh, to conduct airstrikes against uh, Aleppo and Syria. We'll go to NPR, please. Mm. Uh, it's no further back. Mm. Thanks, Mr. Secretary General. Terry Schultz with uh, NPR. Um, I, I'm interested in finding out um, uh, what you know and how much you've been asking about the number of Turkish um, diplomats and military officers who are no longer here in headquarters, um, whether you're, you've followed up on this issue with Turkey, if you're concerned about it, just today Human Rights Watch has put out a new, uh, a new report saying that people being held in detention there are being tortured. And if you could also say something about your new intelligence chief in an unrelated matter. Thank you. <coughs> First on the intelligence uh, uh, chief or uh, assistant secretary general for intelligence. Uh, NATO has uh, been working uh, for a long time on how we can uh, further strengthen uh, our work on intelligence, how we can uh, do even more when it comes to sharing intelligence. And one of the important uh, tasks for NATO is to share intelligence, is to enhance the way we do intelligence uh, cooperation within uh, the uh, alliance. And therefore we, uh, uh, therefore we decided to establish a new division uh, to coordinate and to strengthen our intelligence work. Uh, this division is now uh, being established and I, uh, just a couple of days, I appointed a new Assistant Secretary General uh, to be uh, responsible 
for this new division. And all of this is about strengthening uh, the coordination and the work inside the Alliance on intelligence and intelligence uh, uh, sharing. And I'm looking forward to work with the new uh, uh, Assistant Secretary General from Germany on strengthening uh, our, uh, our uh, focus uh, and the way we work on intelligence in the Alliance. Uh, then on Turkey, um, <clears throat> I visited Turkey in August. Uh, I will visit Turkey again uh, in November. Uh, and I met with uh, uh, President Erdogan, uh, the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister, and many other political leaders in uh, Turkey when I, when I uh, visited Turkey in August. And of course, Turkey has the right uh, to prosecute uh, the perpetrators, those uh, behind the failed coup attempt in July. Uh, the important thing is that uh, uh, this is done in accordance with the rule of law. And uh, uh, this is, of course, something I have uh, 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 discussed with uh, uh, my interlocutors in uh, Ankara several times. And I also welcome uh, the cooperation between uh, Turkey and, uh, and uh, the Council of Europe, uh, because I know that the Council of Europe is very focused on how they can work with Turkey, uh, making sure that the uh, uh, prosecution uh, of those uh, responsible for the um, uh, failed coup uh, is done in a way which is uh, uh, in full accordance with the rule of uh, law. Uh, then uh, we have seen uh, a number of changeovers uh, of uh, Turkish military personnel at NATO, at the different NATO headquarters. Uh, I, um, uh, I'm certain that uh, 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 Turkey will, will continue to be able to uh, provide officers uh, to NATO headquarters. And we are in close dialogue with Turkey on this. And that's also one of the issues I expect to discuss with my Turkish uh, interlocutors when I travel to Turkey later on this fall. Thank you. We'll go to Al Arabiya in the fourth row on the aisle, please. Nordin Fridi from the Arabian News Channel. Mr. Secretary General, uh, you received the Iraqi Foreign uh, Minister last week. I imagine you um, discussed the war against Daesh. I would like to, to know what is specifically NATO is providing to Iraq and to allies the, uh, its contribution in the war against Daesh. And uh, um, I don't know if your, uh, what is the assessment of your experts if the Daesh fighters in Mosul are now fleeing Mosul to Syria or just the opposite side? Because some reports are suggesting that they are being joined by a Daesh fighter from Syria to Iraq. Thank you. NATO provides support to Iraq and the uh, global coalition fighting ISIL in Iraq in many different ways. Uh, all NATO allies are part of the coalition and of course it is a great advantage for the coalition, the interoperability, the ability to work together uh, forces uh, from many different nations that has been developed through NATO exercises, uh, through NATO standardization programs, and through uh, NATO operations uh, uh, where uh, NATO allies, but also NATO partners have uh, participated over many, many years. And this interoperability is something which is very useful now for the uh, counter-ISIL uh, coalition in their fight against ISIL, both in Syria and, uh, and Iraq. So uh, NATO has provided a platform uh, for many of the uh, uh, activities, many of the, uh, 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 so the way the coalition is now working in, in Iraq and, uh, and Syria. Then uh, on top of that, uh, NATO provides uh, direct support to the coalition. Uh, we have started to provide uh, support with our uh, surveillance planes, our AWACS planes. And the first flight took uh, uh, place uh, or happened uh, last week on the 20th of October. And we will continue to provide uh, 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 AWACS uh, support for the coalition. 
We have trained Iraqi officers in Jordan for a time, uh, but we are now moving into uh, also training uh, Iraqi officers inside Iraq. And we will start that training uh, in the near future, uh, so we can uh, uh, do even more to help the Iraqi uh, forces. And the whole idea is that NATO, of course, has to be ready to deploy uh, forces in big combat operations, as we have done in Bosnia, in the Balkans, in, in, in Afghanistan before. Uh, but uh, we are more and more focused in NATO on how we can project stability without deploying a large number of combat troops. And the best way to do that is to train local forces, to build local capacity. And that's exactly what we are uh, contributing to by training Iraqi forces, because we believe that in the long run it's a much, it, it's a much more viable and sustainable solution to enable local forces to fight terrorism themselves, to stabilize their own country, instead of NATO doing the combat operations, fighting their wars. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and therefore, we, we will train and we will step up our efforts to help the Iraqi forces. When it comes to the operational situation in Mosul, um, that's something I discussed with, the, with both the, the Iraqi foreign minister. Uh, I discussed it with uh, the presidential envoy, uh, uh, Brett McKirk, uh, when he visited uh, NATO last week. And I discussed it also recently with uh, President, uh, Al uh, Prime Minister al-Badi. But I will not uh, comment on the operational situation, the current operational situation in, uh, in Mosul, because uh, I leave that to those directly responsible for the operations in Mosul. Thank you. We'll go to the front row on the far left, please. <clears throat> Piotr Falkowski, Nerdziennik, Poland. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, could you comment uh, proposed uh, substan substantial increase of uh, uh, Russian military and defense expenditures, uh, um, although uh, general, general economic situation of Russia is declining? Is it the issue that, um, that uh, NATO and Western community may be concerned about? <coughs> So we have seen a significant uh, military uh, build-up in Russia over many years. And uh, uh, defense spending has tripled uh, since the year 2000 in real terms. And uh, this has enabled Russia to invest in new capabilities, in new weapon systems, to do more exercises and to uh, significantly increase their military uh, capability. Um, Combined with uh, the fact that Russia has also been willing to not only invest in their uh, uh, armed forces, but also to use their armed forces against neighbors, as we have seen in uh, Crimea, uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, uh, this is the reason why NATO is responding. And this is part of a pattern uh, which has uh, triggered a, a response from uh, uh, NATO. And that's exactly why uh, NATO uh, has uh, implemented the strongest or the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War. Uh, we uh, are in the process of deploying forces in the eastern part of the alliance, the four battalions. We have uh, established eight new small headquarters uh, in the eastern part of the alliance. And we have uh, increased our ability to reinforce, if needed, uh, with uh, the new High Readiness Joint Task Force and uh, by tripling the size of the NATO Response Force. Uh, we are also now in the process where we see a shift in defense spending within NATO. Because uh, uh, after many years of decline in defense spending, especially among uh, European NATO allies, uh, 2015 was the first year where we saw an increase in defense spending uh, across uh, European NATO allies. And 2016, uh, we expect to see an even further increase in defense spending. So after many years of decline, we now have seen the first increases in uh, defense spending among uh, European NATO uh, allies. I welcome this, and this shows that NATO is able to respond, NATO is able to adapt, uh, to uh, a more assertive Russia and, uh, and uh, the increased uh, uh, military presence of Russia close to our borders. But, let me underline, 
what NATO does is uh, proportionate, it is uh, defensive, and it's full in line with our international commitments, and uh, we are responding in a measured and responsible way. Because we don't want a new Cold War, we don't want a new arms race, and we continue to strive for a more uh, constructive and cooperative relationship with Russia. So we uh, uh, keep the channels for political dialogue open with Russia, uh, because we strongly believe that it is in the interest of both Russia and NATO to uh, uh, avoid further increase in tensions, uh, but to try to find ways to uh, reduce tensions and to avoid a new uh, arms race. Go to Europa Press in row five on the left, please. Thank you, Ana Pisonero from the Spanish News Agency, Europa Press. Quick first question on the AWACS. Um, how many are deployed? And will they have any kind of support role in the operation of uh, to liberate Mosul? And my second quick question, uh, Secretary General, you just mentioned that allies would be taking a decision on support to Sofia. Um, will NATO take on board the three tasks that Sofia is currently doing, uh, meaning intel, uh, well, getting intel where the, where the traffickers are, are, are operating or how they, how they do, and um, also in training the Libyan uh, Coast Guards, and, um, and finally as well uh, to enforce the arms embargo on Libya. Will NATO take on board the three roles? And just if you can really tell us where are we on the, the new uh, NATO operation in the Mediterranean. Is that done? We, we know already all the tasks. Thank you. Uh, first, on the AWACS, <coughs> there will be several flights. Uh, uh, we, will, we started last week uh, and we will progressively increase the number of uh, flights. Uh, so we will pro provide significant support uh, with uh, AWACS uh, to the coalition uh, with uh, also, uh, uh, several flights uh, providing uh, uh, support. Uh, this, this, um, this support is important because it helps the coalition uh, to get a better uh, a picture, uh, air picture, and also provide surveillance and information uh, for the coalition air uh, forces. The, the importance of that is, uh, is obvious because we see uh, all the difficulties. We see the complex and complicated situation both over Syria and over uh, Iraq. I cannot comment on the exact operational details, but I can say that the AWACS planes will not be part of combat operations, but they will provide information, surveillance and air picture uh, for the uh, coalition forces, which is uh, important for them and which increases uh, air safety for the uh, coalition uh, forces. Um, then on Operation uh, SOFIA uh, and, uh, and Sea Guardian, I expect defense ministers to make decisions, the final decisions, on uh, the establishment of the new NATO uh, security uh, mission in uh, the Mediterranean, the Sea Guardian, on the meeting uh, which starts uh, tomorrow. And then also to make decisions on providing support for Operation uh, SOFIA. And after uh, those decisions have been taken uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, I can give you more uh, details. But of course, we are looking into how we can help Operation SOFIA uh, conducting the tasks they are conducting, especially in areas uh, as sharing information and uh, logistics, uh, helping them to, uh, to, to, yeah, to, to conduct and to, and to do what they do in Operation uh, SOFIA. I uh, hopefully I will be able to provide you more details after uh, the meetings, uh, which uh, start tomorrow. Uh, I think that was all. We'll go to the third row on the far left, please. Daniel Preslin, Süddeutsche Zeitung. I'd like to follow up on Terry's question on the intelligence uh, chief. Uh, why was it necessary to create a new division here? Is it uh, due to uh, the new security environment, or is it just that uh, intelligence sharing uh, within NATO or the headquarter was not sufficient so far? Thank you. <clears throat> the reason is that NATO should always be able to adapt, and uh, we see a more complex uh, security environment. We see a more dangerous security environment. We see different kinds of threat, threats. Uh, we see a more uh, assertive Russia to the east. Uh, we see uh, the violence uh, to the south with ISIL, Iraq, uh, Syria on NATO borders. 
so we have uh, Ukraine bordering NATO. We have, uh, we have uh, Georgia bordering NATO. Uh, and then, of course, we have Syria and Iraq uh, bordering uh, NATO. And then we have the situation in the Mediterranean and North Africa. All of this is close to NATO. All of this uh, poses different kinds of challenges for NATO. Uh, and then linked to the uh, terrorist threats uh, and the threats uh, related to foreign fighters and also returning foreign fighters, there is the need for uh, more sharing of intelligence uh, and, uh, and, uh, and better procedures for how to coordinate intelligence work inside NATO and, and across NATO uh, allies. Uh, we also de uh, decided at our uh, summit in Wales in 2014 to do more intelligence uh, sharing, especially related to foreign fighters and to contribute to the fight against terrorism. So, based on all this, we came to the conclusion that uh, the best way to make sure that we improve our intelligence work is to establish a division where the different strands of intelligence, the civilian intelligence inside NATO, the military intelligence inside NATO, come together and, uh, and, uh, and uh, then this new division with the new Assistant Secretary General will be an, a tool to strengthen uh, coordination sharing of intelligence uh, among NATO uh, allies. Go to the Wall Street Journal, please, in the middle of the room. Julian Barnes, the uh, Wall Street Journal. Uh, in the most uh, recent American presidential debate, uh, Donald Trump said uh, NATO allies singling out uh, Germany are not paying enough for uh, US, uh, the U.S. defense contribution. Uh, he also noted that NATO countries have increased defense spending and suggested that that was a result of his critique. Um, so, should NATO countries pay the U.S. for its uh, defense contribution to Europe, and are Mr. Uh, Trump's criticisms on target, and does he deserve credit for uh, the turnaround in defense spending? I, I am not going to be part of the U.S. Uh, uh, election campaign. It's for the people, the voters of uh, the United States to decide who's going to become the next president of the United States. But what I can do, and as I've done before, is to clarify what matters for uh, NATO. And it has been a very clear message from NATO uh, f over many years uh, that the European, especially European NATO allies, should increase defense spending. And I strongly welcome that after our decision in 2014, we have seen uh, a shift that after years of the decline in defense spending, there is now an increase in defense spending uh, among European uh, NATO allies. But this is not something that was caused by the US election campaign. Uh, because we made a decision in 2014, it has been on top of my agenda in all my meetings with the European uh, leaders. And we saw the first increase in defense spending already in 2015 and we see further increase in 2016. And that's uh, not because of the election campaign in the United States, but it is because 28 heads of state and government in NATO made a decision in 2014, and now we are implementing uh, that uh, decision. Second, I would like to underline that um, NATO's security guarantees are not conditioned. They are absolute, they are unconditional. So NATO is there to defend and protect all allies against any threat. And that is essential for stability in Europe. We do not say that if you don't pay, we don't protect you. We, pro we protect all allies against any threat. And that is essential to keep uh, stability and to prevent conflict. The, the NATO security guarantees are important for Europe, but they are also important for the United States. Strong NATO is good for Europe and, and, and good for the United States. We have to remember that the only time we have invoked Article 5, our collective security clause, was after an attack on the United States, 9-11. Then NATO provided AWACS surveillance planes for the United States, and NATO has uh, been responsible for our biggest military operation ever in Afghanistan, 
where more than 1,000 soldiers from non-US NATO allies and partner countries have paid the highest price, have lost their lives in a military operation defending the United States. So I'm saying this just to underline that collective defense is important for Europe, but it's also important for the United States. Uh, uh, NATO has played a key role, has been at, on the front line in the fight against terrorism for many, many years. Uh, with our, our operation in Afghanistan, training Iraqi officers, supporting Tunisia, Jordan, and, uh, and in many other ways. So, uh, um, as I've stated many times, uh, the adaptation of NATO, where we focus more on intelligence, where we step up our efforts to fight terrorism, where we increase defense spending, is not related to the uh, US election campaign. It's, uh, uh, impl it's implementation of decisions uh, made by heads of state and government uh, in NATO. Thank you. We're going to go to Norwegian media in row three. Yeah, I'm Alf Johnson, VG newspaper. Mr. Secretary General, uh, 10 days ago you uh, expressed concern about the, uh, the deployment of the Iskander uh, missiles in, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the outskirts of NATO. Is this an enhanced threat to European security and, and would, would there be a forceful or will there be any NATO response to the deployment in the short term? The, the deployment of Iskander missiles to Kaliningrad is uh, yet another example of a Russian military buildup close to NATO borders. Uh, also with uh, dual capable uh, capabilities like the Iskanders because they can carry conventional uh, warheads but they can also carry uh, nuclear uh, warheads. And of course we are uh, concerned about the Russian military buildup uh, close to NATO borders. And we see it uh, in the east, but we also see it in the south, in the eastern Mediterranean, and in uh, Syria, close to Turkey, NATO ally. Uh, we are responding in a measured uh, and responsible way. And that's the reason why we uh, have, uh, over a long time now, uh, gradually increased our collective defense with the increased deployment of forces uh, uh, in the eastern part of the alliance with the establishment of the new high readiness force, uh, the WJTF, uh, able to deploy uh, uh, rapidly, uh, if needed, to reinforce. Uh, and uh, with the tripling of the size of the NATO response force to 40,000. Uh, so we are responding, uh, but we are responding in a measured uh, and responsible way. And, uh, and what we do is defensive. So it's always this, uh, importance of responding, uh, but uh, not overreacting. And, uh, and that's also what we're doing uh, when it comes to uh, the deployment of uh, Iskander, which is only one element of a broader picture. Thank you. Go to European Pravda, please. Mm. Sergei Sidorenko, Ukraine. Uh, recently met Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko and he stated after that visit and after that meeting with you that he expects NATO to help, Ukro uh, to help Ukraine push on Russia uh, to fulfill uh, Minsk obligations. Do you see how can NATO push on Russia? Do you see some ways probably with cooperation with the EU or some other measures and uh, probably you have some new data about Russian presence in Donbass. Thank you very much. I uh, very much appreciate uh, the frequent meetings I have with uh, I have had with uh, with uh, President Poroshenko. Uh, we met in September in the UN. Then we met last week uh, here at NATO headquarters, and uh, uh, that reflects the very close partnership between Ukraine and uh, NATO. Uh, I assured him that NATO uh, will provide strong political support and strong practical support for Ukraine. Uh, we provide practical support through our different programs, trust funds, and uh, uh, I also encourage all NATO allies to provide support on the bilateral level, uh, training of uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, forces. NATO provides uh, all the kinds of support uh, through our trust funds. Uh, and we will step up our support. We just made decisions at the Warsaw Summit to, to establish a comprehensive package for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, Ukraine. 
Then we uh, support Ukraine uh, by calling on Russia to make sure that uh, the Minsk agreements are fully implemented. And Russia has uh, a great responsibility because uh, Russia continues to support uh, the separatists in Donbas. Uh, they continue uh, to be uh, present uh, and therefore they have a special responsibility to make sure that the uh, Minsk agreements are fully implemented. Which, mean, which means uh, full respect for the ceasefire, redrawal of heavy weapons, and then access for the international monitors so they can monitor uh, without being threatened uh, the implementation of the uh, ceasefire. NATO also strongly support the initiative by, uh, by Germany and France to uh, NATO allies. Uh, uh, working on how to uh, uh, implement the Minsk agreements and also the meeting in the uh, Normandy format and the agreement to try to establish a roadmap how to step by step implement the Minsk agreements. So I can assure you that we will continue to call on Russia to uh, uh, seek a peaceful negotiated solution uh, based on the uh, Minsk agreements, and we will continue to support Ukraine, and we will continue to support all efforts to implement the Minsk agreements. Go in the front row on the left, please. Thank you, Andrei Matyshek, Slovakia, David Pravda. Uh, one question regarding uh, propaganda and hybrid warfare. NATO has STRATCOM, uh, EU has own task force. Now Czechs uh, are also establishing a uh, anti-propaganda center. Would, would you like to see some more cooperation among uh, various actors we have? And the second one, a bit following up on a question about Mr. Trump. Uh, many observers are saying that uh, Russia would be happy having Mr. Trump as a U.S. president. Do you agree with this assessment? Thank you. Uh, first on uh, propaganda, um, we see that uh, Russia uh, <coughs> is uh, uh, providing a lot of, um, is, is, is supporting different groups, uh, trying to uh, uh, influence domestic uh, debate in different uh, countries in Europe, uh, and we see a lot of propaganda. Uh, but NATO will not counter propaganda with propaganda. Uh, our message uh, is that uh, in the long run the truth will prevail. Uh, so the best answer to propaganda is not more propaganda, but the best answer to propaganda is facts, the truth, and the open democratic debate. And therefore, we will continue, of course, to support uh, uh, the uh, uh, provision of facts uh, of, uh, of the truth, uh, because we are certain that in the long run that's the best way to counter propaganda. We do that by uh, uh, our own efforts in NATO, but we work also together with the European Union on the staff level to see how we can improve routines, uh, exchange of information, so we can help each other uh, with getting the uh, facts straight. I also welcome very much efforts by different NATO allies uh, on uh, this issue, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the Czech Republic and other countries have done a lot, and I uh, welcome that. Uh, we, we will uh, also underline, I will also, also underline that, of course, the main responsibility for uh, taking part in the different debate uh, and discussions in different NATO allies lies in the different NATO allies. We cannot do all this from Brussels. What we can do in Brussels is to provide facts, is to help, is to coordinate, but the discussions, the, 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 the countering of the propaganda has to take place in the different mem member states. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. I apologize if I didn't get to. There were far more questions than we were able to get to this time. But there'll be oh, several sorry, more. I forgot one. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so as I said, I'm not going to be part of the uh, U.S. election campaign. Uh, uh, I just very clearly stated what matters for NATO, and that is that uh, the NATO security guarantees are absolute. They are unconditional. Uh, we uh, do not say that if you don't pay, we don't protect you. Uh, we protect all NATO allies, and at the same time, I welcome that uh, more and more European NATO allies actually are increasing defense spending. 
and, uh, and uh, that's a result of decisions taken by NATO back in 2014, and, uh, and I welcome that these decisions are uh, now being implemented. Thanks. I'm afraid that is all we'd have time for. There'll be several more opportunities over the coming two days. Thank you. Thank you.